Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining me today in overviewing how we can use and improve process simulation to support the development of the plans for tomorrow. Thank you also to NRG events for setting this powerful conference in these strange times. This gathering will benefit us all, I truly believe so. Let me just quickly introduce myself. So my name is Ivana Lukets. I'm PhD in chemical engineering and coming from a family owned small business that was founded in 1993. I have 18 years of experience of applying mathematical modeling and simulation in industrial practice. I have done a lot of projects, including conceptual design, basic design, optimization studies, advanced process control applications, virtual designs, benefit studies, OTS. I especially enjoy working on benefit studies and finding the opportunities for improvement. Today, I work in project execution as a trainer and author. And you can find my work at my website, evanalukas.com, and also uh, on simulatelive.com. And what is one of my passion related to chemical engineering is to motivate chemical engineers to create and innovate more. So what we can expect in future related to development of mathematical modeling and simulation and its role in process industry? Well, for sure, I don't have a magic ball, so it's hard to tell and I have no idea. But for sure, this last year has taught us all that it is impossible to predict what tomorrow is bringing. And we are all coming from different industries, from different level of industry development, we come from small industries, large industries, highly optimized factories, and factories that still struggle with some basic efficiency. But there is one thing that all of us have in common. We live on the same planet and have the same worries. And there couldn't be a better teacher than what the present is teaching us. So what we need to change in our future. And this all connects us to one word, that I want to start the presentation with, and that word is the sustainability. It's a fancy word. We meet it every day. Our documents, our presentation, our sales copies, our projects, they are all full of this word. But can we really understand what it means? And can we really comprehend the meaning? Well, I have to say for me personally, similar to many of you, most of my experience is coming from heavy industry, such as oil and gas, chemicals. I analyzed and modeled dozens of processes in different industries. And similar to many of you, I understand and see very good what goes in and what goes out of the process. And these are not roses. But I still need to commit that I did not have a true understanding of what sustainability means. We are all so much caught up in our lifestyle, driving to work, driving back, using all the commodities of the modern world, using so much things we don't actually need that we don't notice. And a good lesson for me personally was something completely different out of engineering things. It was watching David Attenborough documentary called A Life on Our Planet. It took me out of my life and out of my brain and it shows reality in a very cold way, an exact way, and supported with real numbers, just as we engineers like it. And what it brings is the real picture and different reality to our mind. However, this reality, cruel as it is, as well, brings the frame for inspiration and innovation. It is undivided part of what we use process simulation for. And this is something that inspires me to talk with my tiny little words and do a tiny little actions. Okay, so how I see the future of process modeling and simulation. And note here, of course, make sure to watch the documentary if you still didn't. And before going into anything technical, not even mentioning any process model, we need to model our surroundings for enabling creation and innovation. Put a kind of a ground floor for whether you work in industry, consulting business, as a solution provider in research and development. Let's put the frame for creativity and innovation with these four key points before going into anything technical. 
So the following key, four key points are necessary conditions for innovation. First of all, to ask ourselves questions, what we are doing and why are we doing it? Are we doing actions that will enable a better life a decade from now or not? Also, to admit to ourselves some unavoidable facts, that the paths we as humans chosen in the past were quite selfish and away from sustainable development. That is a fact. And to really change it, we first need to accept it in order to be able to talk, discuss, cooperate between us people. From me to you, from you to me, let's working together, not against each other. And we need to really encourage, give the right setting, give the time to enable creativity and innovation. And it, it's not only about the money, about the schedule, really doing something important takes time and commitment. So we are all aware that the change will not come for us tomorrow. We will still be for decades driving cars based on petroleum, but every one of us can do little things in the right direction. So now let's get slowly into technical stuff. When talking about process industry or energy industry, what are we going to model in future? How I see a rough picture in general that there are two different flows. They have always been and they will always remain so. The first point of view is design point of view, where we need to model our processes to improve their efficiency. We will need to model and innovate new paths and processes and modernize and reconstruct existing processes. Looking into operation point of view, that looks into dynamics of the process, how to improve everyday operation, so data availability has changed dramatically over last years. So our ways of monitoring and controlling the production are changing. Models are already used for monitoring and prediction in different smart systems and for training and education. Having in mind that the industry needs to speed up its trans transformation, I hope you agree with me that the future of process modeling and simulation looks hugely bright. Let's review all those options in some more details. So by the definition of sustainability, the one coming from the books says that sustainability development, sustainable development is a process of change in which the exploitation of resources, the direction of investments, the orientation of technological development and institutional change are made consistent with future as well as present needs. This is at least what we are aiming for. In other words, the key point of the concept is that the main focus is not only an economic, a financial one, but also responsibility towards social and ecological environment as well, or so to say, triple P, that looks into needs of people, needs of planet and profits, aiming towards balance. To design processes that are sustainable, environmentally friendly and economically valid, there's a long way we need to go. And one of the ways is modeling or designing sustainable processes that refers to mainly the following three categories. The first one is modeling and designing new environmentally friendly processes. Process integration is a very a very important part of this, which means that improved efficiency by improving resource efficiency will play a major part. And all the existing processes that are in any way harmful to the, our surroundings need to be reanalyzed and optimized in terms of energy and emissions. So this is what process modeling will be focused in our close future. Process design this development is for sure going to follow the trends such as using renewable feedstocks, using renewable energy, preventing waste, designing less hazardous chemical synthesis, using catalysts instead of reagents, promoting recycling, optimizing heat and material integration, designing environmentally friendly products, using safer solvents, implementing real-time analysis control and much more. But this all relates in a way to application of process modeling and simulation. 
And when talking about designing new processes, modeling is an is inevitable part, of course. It's the models should be developed in close collaboration with the process design, as is shown on this picture. And the most competitive and sustainable process is the overall aim. When talking about improving efficiency, I would especially like to put more accent on it because what I mean by that is improving general feeds, products and resources efficiency, not only energy efficiency that we used to buy now, meaning applying general highly integrated processes. And what do I mean by that? Let's have a look into a traditional heat integration improvement by pinch method. By looking into these two process flow diagrams that belong to the same unit, by the activity that has so far been applied which pit, with pinch analysis on many units, and some still address it with high focus, we can see the following. So the first flow diagram on the left is showing a traditional design of the chemical process. As you can see, feed goes through the number of heat exchangers, is going to a reactor section, and after that, again, through heat exchangers into a separation section. The flow diagram on the right shows an, an alternative design that used pinch analysis as a technique of process integration and improvement. It is used for energy targeting and network integration. Here you can see that feed goes through a lower number of heat exchangers. So the original design has six heat transfer units, while the alternative flow sheet uses only four heat transfer units. And the utility heating load is reduced by 40% with cooling no longer being required. Design on the right is as safe and as operable as a traditional one. And this is just one example of a typical result when heat integration is applied using pinch analysis. It is also a traditional method that we used so far across industries. But the case is that this method that is highly beneficial can be used for any type of resource, feeds or product. For example, carbon management. The thing is that analysis of resource efficient pathways that have high level of integration are not only friendlier to the environment, but are also often more economical than the inefficient ones. How is that? This is very much covered with mentioned pinch method. So if you're not familiar with a pinch, it is a graphical and modeling method that optimizes exchange of sources and demands. And pinch analysis of heat exchanger is the most known. However, this technique can and will be in future applied on any problem that is looking into exchange of materials or exchange of energy. So whenever we are dealing with different sources and demands that are involved. So for example, where, where pinch analysis can be and will be applied. It's basically everywhere across industries. I'll name just a few examples. A typical traditional integration of heat exchangers. Optimizing use of geothermal energy by optimizing its demand and sources. Hydrogen management already mentioned carbon management, water management. So this can all be used to optimize available sources and use them in a best and optimized way. Then another example of how we will use mathematical simulation and modeling in process design. As mentioned, modernization of existing processes. I'll give a one example of a batch process and the project I just finished together with a multidiscipline team. It is about how to improve energy efficiency of batch reactors. And deep analysis using mathematical models of one gave pretty impressive saving results of nearly 60% decrease in heating energy costs 
and almost 30 decrease in 30 percent decrease in cooling energy costs how is that possible how so impressive results can be possible well simply by not simply but at the end simply by replacing the reactor with new modern materials and insulation using hot oil as an energy supplier instead of steam and using a closed system facility owned closed and optimized energy system for heating and cooling instead of external expensive and inflexible supply of course new measurements and control had to be applied so we can have control uh, of what is entering the process and what is going out of the process and that we use minimum sufficient energy supply the biggest benefit of this improvement is not measured in money it is significantly lowered impact on the environment and that's important and this is the way that we will continue to approach our existing units and processes The other route of using process modeling, as I mentioned, is using it to improve operation. So we'll continue using existing application as we know them, I will mention them, but we will grow them, improve them, use them in larger acquisitions of data, use larger acquisition on the information and certainly make a better use of them. One of it is process modeling, is process monitoring. <laughs> okay. One of it is process monitoring and prediction. Another example of integration, but here we are talking about information integration through the connected smart systems. And with a great need to focus more on training and education for growing complexity of our systems. So process modeling, as we know it, has for decades been applied as a tool for process optimization. And it is by default using dynamic models, of course. Known and widely applied applications for decades include model predictive control, soft sensors, and in, or inferentials, virtual sensor, how you like to call them, that predict our qualities, which are all practically basis for applying advanced process control. These ways of control have become standards across industries over the years. However, we are living in a time when the ceiling has been broken and with the data acquisition and new worlds that have opened that we are still not able to comprehend and follow but they will open a wide area for innovation creativity and development what is the story about process data it is the fact that we use huge amounts of data and they are full of information full of knowledge but we do not use even 10 percent of the knowledge we could really use and there is especially huge space for improvement related to pro topics of process optimization. So therefore, the basic principle of predictive analytics and data analysis is going to be accepted and deployed more across industries, meaning that historical and live data are going to be used to recognize past and current process behavior giving the answer to the question, what happened in our process? And by continuously looking into data and using them for building predictive models, this will give the answer to the question, what is happening in the real time? Moreover, those models are used for prediction to tell us what will happen in future. And by looking into this estimation, it gives an opportunity to improve the process control. So this has been used in the past, but it will be more used in, in the future, uh, more dedicated to specific control needs, to equipment, etc. And as mentioned, where we are already using it and will use even more related to process optimization as applications in process monitoring, process control, process prediction. 
Equipment is also one big part of it, where we will be using it for predictive maintenance, improved availability, improved safety and reliability of our equipment, such as pumps, heat exchangers, reactors, columns, etc. We will be looking everything through the models. So how do I imagine the plant of the future with all this that I have been telling you about? Well, I see it as a modern, highly integrated and environmentally friendly plant where everything is, as I mentioned throughout the presentation a couple of times, highly integrated from energy to emissions, feeds and products. And with integration of information, such as production plans, market demands, etc., a plant that has full automation of all safety and optimization needs and can very well be run by an, an adaptable model. So equipment and operation is monitored through a health prediction system and maintain according to real-time information. And I believe you, you fully agree with me when I say that models are going to have a major role in this, and they already do. With this level of complexity, the role of education is going to be of huge importance. So virtual plants, such as digital twins, Powered with effective and correct dynamic models, having the ability to replicate fully integrated automation systems will be our role models for all of us to learn an opportunity to make errors and to improve from this. And in the basis, there are certainly dynamic models of the plants. So I did cover extensive materials and topics. But the key points that I'd like you to take away from this are the following. So the process modeling is inevitable support pillar of any industrial development. And we are going to use it a lot, both in optimizing process design and optimizing our everyday operation. Thinking sustainability is the only thinking possible and yeah, Remember to watch that David Attenborough documentary if you still didn't. Innovation and creativity, they need time, space and support. And we must make sure that our organizations support it. Because this is the way to change that starts from every one of us. And I'd like you to finish, I'd like to finish with the questions, what will you focus on? because I have covered a couple of topics and given a couple of different examples. And I suggest that you take a one piece of it and try to connect it to your everyday life and see how can you professionally use it for future? What can you focus on to improve in future? How can you use the model to improve something in your professional surrounding? What all these parts mentioned are resonating good with you? Is it innovation? Is it some kind of industry? What kind of optimization can you put forward? So I'd like you to take one piece of it and try to apply it in your everyday surroundings. So this is where I like to thank you and I would like to hear your feedback. So please connect with me over LinkedIn uh, or just pop me a, an email. I'll be glad to hear uh, your comments and thoughts. And also please uh, refer to the websites of model, even and simulate live.com for more topics of, the, uh, of this. And yeah, let's connect. I hope you find this interesting and wishing you a very nice and rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you.
Are your new hires disengaged and having a hard time grasping basic plant concepts? Are your experienced operators bored of PowerPoints? Let Simtronics help get your team ahead of the learning curve. We provide the right solution for your trainees at every level of learning, from basic fundamentals through advanced troubleshooting. Our training products will give you the tools you need to train console operators together with field operators, effectively teach skills for normal operation, startups, shutdowns, troubleshooting, and emergency response, and ensure operator competency through objective performance testing. Simtronics offers a structured training path for your operators to follow, from new hire to experienced operator. New hires start off simple with equipment tutorials and SPM e-learning. These tools help them rapidly learn all major components of the process prior to using the simulator by interacting with a library of movies, 3D visualizations, P and IDs, and DCS screens, all at their own pace. Once trainees comprehend the basic concepts, they move on to training workbooks, where they will learn to put the concepts together. These workbooks use a blended learning approach, providing a comprehensive curriculum for both basic operators and field operators, saving the instructor time and effort. Trainees can then move on to the simulator and virtual field operator for hands-on training. Here they can apply the knowledge they've gained and practice operation skills before moving into the plant. The highly sophisticated yet easy to use DSS-100 delivers a wide array of benefits to console operator trainees and instructors. A realistic training environment, comprehensive training, demonstrations of skills, improved troubleshooting skills, flexible training exercises, better knowledge transfer and retention, adherence to standard operating procedures, and measurable performance. With the DSS-100 simulator, trainees develop skills in a realistic plant environment, viewing graphics in either gray or black, whichever way works best for them. Data provided through the DCS helps trainees determine the root cause of various failures. Instructors can design unlimited training exercises using any number of equipment or instrument failures. Embedded tutorials and aids enhance blended learning. A robust performance scoring tool calculates an objective score based on multiple parameters. Running alongside the simulator, the virtual field operator is an interactive 3D training environment that enables trainees to learn about field operator responsibilities. The VFO allows trainees to trace flows and verify instrumentation back to the console for realistic troubleshooting. For higher level trainees, the SimTech library of training exercises focuses on advanced troubleshooting and abnormal situation management. No matter what level your trainees are at, Simtronics has the tools, software, and experience to keep them ahead of the learning curve. Welcome, I'm Tim Judge from Simtronics. Uh, today's presentation is Operator Training Simulators Move to the Cloud. The future is here for state-of-the-art cloud OTS. Quick overview of Simtronics. We've been in business since 1992, so it's almost 30 years now. We have our SimSeries OTS for the cloud, our DSS-100 OTS for Windows, our performance scoring utility. We do standard and custom process models, and we have our virtual field operator which runs from a desktop also on the immersive igloo vision which is a 360 degree dome and cylinder uses a game controller with a gyroscope and we also have our oculus virtual reality headsets and we're working on integrating the cloud vfo in with the simsiris ots for the cloud 
outline for today for our operator training simulators move to the cloud. Quick history of operator training simulators. Windows OTS remote methodologies that are being used today and in the last, I say, five years or so. What are OTS vendors using now? And this includes uh, Symtronics and other vendors from around the world. What does a true OTS cloud application look like? And then we'll take a look at the Symtronics cloud OTS from Symtronics and then draw a couple of conclusions. So back in 1965, uh, analog panel board simulators came out for operator training. Auto Dynamics was big into that with their 1501. I actually worked for them as a cup as a student in college a couple of summers. Uh, first summer I worked on a crude unit simulation. I think it was for mobile. And the next summer worked on a uh, brand new uh, deck PDP-8. And it was a mini computer. And it was kind of the prelude for uh, microcomputers and workstations to come. The first microcomputers came out in 1975. I started to work with Atlantic Simulation as a company in 1980. And the first PC came out from IBM in 1981. And during that time, we were using some other microcomputers from Altos and Stride, uh, creating operator training simulators with them. Uh, other vendors also use workstations from the likes of Sun and DEC. Windows came out in 1985, and 3.1 version, which was a significant leap, came out in 1992. And I started with uh, a company, a company Centronics in 1992, and we started right out of the gate with uh, window operator training simulators. So eventually, Windows in the cloud became available. Uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services premiered in 2006. Microsoft Azure in 2010, uh, which I think really got the ball rolling. And we were looking at it right from about 2010, putting Windows in the cloud. We put our first uh, Windows simulator in the cloud actually on AWS in 2015. Our first client was in 2017, but realized it really wasn't the answer. Uh, so we began back in about 2017, looking at what a true cloud OTS web application uh, would look like. So Windows, OTS remote methodologies. These are methodologies that all of Centronics clients have used over probably the last uh, five or 10 years. Initially, it was just on a LAN or WAN, a local area network or a wide area network. Uh, the WAN would include some school campuses or industrial plants. A lot of the schools ended up uh, standardizing on Microsoft RDP remote desktop and then using VPN, virtual private network for security. Streaming video became big because of COVID last year, starting in March. A lot of people in schools and industry started scrambling to do training and the quickest, easiest solution was just to stream it using uh, Zoom was obviously popular and still is. Uh, we saw, I don't know why, but Verizon Blue Jeans in Africa and of course Microsoft uh, Teams. Virtual machines all along have been big, uh, particularly with companies industrial plants uh, running on uh, VMware, uh, another product they had called VApp Connect, and then what they had is vCloud they ended up with as far as virtual machines. And a couple of other ones, software to apps, Microsoft Azure Hyper-V, uh, one of our educational clients early on put the simulator, we didn't even know about it, into an AT&T cloud for multiple campuses, and then Symtronics used the AWS cloud for our first Windows in the cloud product. Most industrial clients standardized on Citrix, and then a Citrix cloud came out uh, to avoid having to buy the hardware, software, maintain it, et cetera. Um, they've moved to Citrix in the cloud, which is where most of our industrial clients are right now. And virtual machines continue to be big. That's kind of a, a snapshot of, of what's happened over the last five or 10 years. 
And then we're going to look at where OTS vendors are now. So what are we using now? As I said, Citronix used AWS desktop early on for Windows OTS. Other vendors, everyone today seems to be using the AWS AppStream 2.0. AppStream came out in 2017 or 18. Uh, it's a Windows client in the cloud, the new 2.0 version. And applications can be streamed in a browser, but it's the same old Windows applications being streamed. There are a lot of limitations with this. And there's also Windows in the cloud using AppStream 2.0 and Windows in the cloud are kind of a hybrid with a web front end to some sort of Windows OTS on some other application. Uh, but the big one seems to be AppStream 2.0. So what are the limitations of this? Access is limited. You can only run a minimum number of users at the same time, maybe 10, uh, which we believe is a large limitation. Bandwidth and latency issues. Uh, latency is you do something and it takes a while for it to happen. That could be highly frustrating for the end user. Repurposing legacy software, so it's the same software, it's just in the cloud. Uh, we believe back in 2017 or 18, when we were looking at AppStream and desktop on AWS and looking at Azure, there really wasn't a way to go putting Windows in the cloud. Uh, and I kind of equate it to DVD technology when Netflix is available. So you're just streaming something that already exists versus using something that is designed for the web. So we believe overall that Windows in the cloud is a poor way to go. So what does a true OTS cloud application look like? It's a software as a service, or the acronym is SAAS. It's not Windows. It's a true web application supporting web browsers from Chrome to Edge to Safari to Firefox, et cetera. And it's device agnostic. That means it works on anything. It doesn't have to be a Windows device. It can work on PCs, Macs, Android tablets and phones, Apple iPads and phones, anything that has a browser and internet. And it supports touchscreen. And it has to have guaranteed uptime and it runs on the popular clouds that are available out there now like azure and aws and these environments need to be secure isolated scalable efficient and run with faster performance so if you have something like this what are some of the benefits zero infrastructure for the client there's no downloads there's no hardware there's no software there's absolutely no IT involvement. Seamless upgrades. Upgrades are happening all the time. Guaranteed levels of service. That means that no matter where you are in the world, it means you can access it anytime, anywhere. Backups and data recovery. So everything's being constantly backed up. And all the data is secure and encrypted. And it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days a year and scalable. So scalable doesn't mean you can go from two to three or 10 users at the same time. It means you can go to hundreds, not thousands of users at the same time. Annual descriptions and quick deployment. And quick deployment means a matter of hours, not days. And the guaranteed levels of service also means that there's automated hot backups, which means that no matter if something happens, it'll automatically swap over to something else in the cloud, and you won't even know that there's a difference. So I'd like to introduce what Centronics has been working on, and it's called Simsiris. This is our OTS for the cloud. It is a true web application, and we believe it's a giant leap into the future. And again, we started working on this three or four years ago. It's an all new web application written in JavaScript. So it's not any old Windows code. It's nothing Windows. We started from ground zero, rewrote a brand new simulator. And we released it in March of last year, 2020. Uh, 
we did that because COVID hit and we were close and we decided to just uh, release it and to try to help people because people were asking us, how can we do this remotely? Because uh, we're having problems with IT, et cetera. And again, it supports the modern web browsers, Chrome Edge, Safari, Firefox, et cetera. It's device agnostic, like I talked about, any device with internet and a browser. It supports the touch screen. There's operator and admin modules, and they're both just a URL that you log into. And it's quick deployment. Do it in a matter of hours. So imagine being on your phone or tablet, the touch screen, and being able to operate a simulator anywhere, anytime. So what does the operator module look like? So I know I've been in this business a long time, and we took a good hard look at uh, emulations. You know, there are large one-to-one -one simulators out there, custom simulators, which are take up a room and you can only do a couple people at a time. And then of course, there's your Windows applications running in a cloud. Um, there are different sometimes emulations available from the likes of Honeywell, Yokogawa, et cetera. But we wanted to create a standardized user interface, uh, but yet could be like a lot of the different DCS systems out there. So we have this concept called themes and you can select multiple graphic colors and you can select multiple DCS faceplates. We have currently Experion and Gus from Honeywell, Centum VP and CS3000 from Yokogawa, Delta V from Emerson, Evo and IA from Foxborough, PCS7 from Siemens and the, the ABB 800 XA. And we continue to add more. And then we have multiple trend styles, different background colors. Is it trending from right to left? Is it trending from left to right? So you can take whatever themes you want and select them and it will closely mimic whatever DCS system that you have. And then you can save this as a default and you can save it for a particular plant or a particular person or whatever resolution that you want. And then of course we have your normal displays like graphics, trend displays, detail displays, group displays, alarm, event log, and logbook displays. The, the normal screens that you would expect to see from a DCS system and that you see on most OTS simulators today. Some Cirrus, the administration administration <laughs> administrator module. So it's the overall administrator. It's a separate URL login. You can set up sites and departments. So let's say you're a refinery and you have multiple sites around the world. Uh, you can set up an administrator or instructors for those different sites at those different physical locations. And then you can set up departments within there, like your cat cracker operators, like your brood unit operators, etc. So you can set up all of the people all the instructors and administrators and then you can add edit and delete trainees and it will list whatever process models that you have available and then it stores all the historical data the event log data the trend data as usual you can develop exercises and standards and you can set all the default parameters again as i said for particular operators or a particular control room, particular plant, et cetera, and multiple scoring methodologies. So I took a look at this and we have our PSU 100, which is a performance scoring utility that does require you to create a standard. And then you see the trainee data, which is the trending data and the event log. And then we compare those against the standard and you get a score. But I looked at what's out there today and what performance scoring methodologies are used today? And I looked at the uh, different OTS vendors in the world and found out what I could and found that some have no scoring. Most seem to have some sort of form of weight-based variables. So that you add evaluation variables like certain PVs that you want to monitor, you provide high and low values, and you add a criticality to it. Is it important? Is it less important, et cetera? And then, the simulator, the scoring utility will 
look at those particular PVs, et cetera. There's also things like dynamic profitability analysis, safety indexes, counters, et cetera, um, kind of starting at a score of 100 and counting down. Um, we, as I said before, we have our performance scoring utility and we get very into depth on this. So we have six criteria, including time, SOP, alarms, quality. First one is duration. So if a trainee does the troubleshooting exercise, let's say in less time, they get 100%. And then we look at the procedure. We actually parse through the event log and pull out the SOP, the standard operating procedure, and compare that against the standard. So it's like an SOP checker. And then safety, we integrate the area that PVs are an alarm. And if trainee gets a number less than that, they get 100%. Then we look at alarms, how many loops are an alarm at the end of the run. And then we look at deviation, which is integrating the areas that PVs were in excess of design. And again, and again, compare that against a standard. And then we look at product quality, measuring the difference between the PVs and the design at the end of the simulation run. And then you get a six scores from zero to 100 and overall score and then group scores etc uh, but we did decide that because different people we have found also through the years they like different ways of scoring some people don't score at all some people love the scoring and then there's ones in between so we decided with some serious to have multiple scoring methodologies it allows the end user to define how they want to score so you're able to pick and choose how you want to do your scoring. It's all very simple. It takes into account all known scoring methodologies that we know of, and it also includes our PSU 100 methodology. So where is SimSiris now and in the future? So today, we released it about a year ago. We have lots of clients. Uh, one client is running 250 trainees at a time every day. Uh, we have over 1,000 overall trainees right now. We have 90, over 90 standard process models available. And since Cirrus gets seamlessly updated every weekend with improvements. And whatever we're working on goes into it every weekend. And we've integrated uh, the documentation is on an online help. So there's really no manuals. Everything is within the SimSiris itself. So where is SimSiris now in the future? So our future roadmap. We use crowdsourcing and heat maps to dictate features. So with a lot of end users now using our product, we actually use heat maps. So there are ways with true web applications to see where people are going. So we track what they are looking at, what screens are going to, and we look for things like sticking points where maybe they're having trouble. And then we refine those particular features to make them easier to use. And then we can also see perhaps where they're going for something and the information's not there, and that'll lead to new features. And then also crowdsourcing. So we're obtaining input from a large group of people using our products. There is integrated into the SimSiris uh, in the, within the help section and it's asking, gee, do you like this? Do you not like this? What kind of features do you like to see? And we're getting feedback that way also. So crowdsourcing and heat maps uh, is a great way to dictate features for what we're doing. We're continuing to add and enhance our operator and administrator features, in particular to add resolution to themes to emulate almost any DCS. Because part of the large pushback that you get in plants is it's not my process, it's not my DCS. So with a large amount of standard process models, we hope to alleviate that's not my unit and with the ability to manipulate the way the man machine interface looks we can get rid of, it's not my DCS. And then the VFO, virtual field operator, integrating with some Cirrus. So with the way we're doing it, we're actually looking at a way of incorporating the VFO with some Cirrus, so it'll all be available from the cloud. So you'd be able to train both console and field operators, and they could be in different places, it really doesn't matter and also to implement AI and for artificial intelligence in the future.
So what are the conclusions? So there's lots of ways to run OTSs in the cloud. And we went through a lot of those today with regards to what people have been doing the last five or 10 years, also where the OTS vendors are today. Uh, we decided about four years ago to take a different path from Windows in the cloud and put almost all of our development efforts into SimSiris, which is a true cloud OTS web application. And we believe it's the only one out there. And uh, please come to our booth and take a look. Again, Tim Judge, here's my email address, uh, my LinkedIn profile, and my phone number. If you have any questions, please get in contact with us. Thank you very much. Without properly trained workforces, industrial workplaces can be deadly. According to a Gartner's report in 2018, only 20% 20 of employees have the skills needed for their current roles. Every day, approximately 6,400 people die from occupational hazards, and human errors have been the 90% contributing factor in case of all industrial mishappenings. The best education for a human being is practice and reality, but this can be very expensive, logistically difficult, and potentially dangerous in a place like petrochemical refinery. It's time to reinvent the industrial training spaces. Yokogawa introduces VR OTS, the empathetic virtual reality operator training system designed by certified industry 4.0 professionals with years of oil and gas industry experience. This groundbreaking technology greatly shortens the learning curve of trainees with knowledge transfer rates up to 75 to 90 percent. They also learn seven times faster than usual. VR OTS caters the end-to-end -end training needs of oil and gas refineries, upstream, downstream, power plants, pharmaceuticals, and other process plants. This is the most advanced training for operations management, maintenance, and emergency management. The moment the head-mounted VR devices are put on, trainees get teleported into the photorealistic virtual environment replicating the physical plant. Now they can start their interactive training sessions right inside the whole new immersive world without risking lives and budgets. feed pump B from the local switch box. Different roles to choose from, either DCS operator, field operator, maintenance technician or supervisor. Support single user mode and collaborative team mode, mimicking real life scenarios. Three different simulation modes covering observe, train and test. Simulations can be set to either computer generated parameters or live IoT streaming data from the connected plant selection of personal protective equipment, dynamically simulated scenarios, such as too bleak in a furnace, fire accidents, or anything you could imagine which are otherwise impossible to train in real life. Select from the list of predefined scenarios or create your own custom scenarios and save them for later. Supervisors can monitor the current users inside the VR session and can give remote assist in real time. Very first time, the true key performance index of the trainees are measured through empirical analysis methodologies. Performance evaluation reports are generated into logical categories with easily trackable trend graphs, automatic video recording of sessions for evaluation purposes. VR OTS offers amazing results on productivity and safety, better economics with great return on investments, and saves companies from legal liabilities. Now is the time to join the fourth industrial revolution. VR OTS, preparing for the smart generation. Powered by Yokogawa Engineering Asia Private Limited. Do you still have fear of disruption or are uncertain on your VR strategies? Reach us for a free consultation. Let's do some brainstorming.
At Emerson, we are proud to serve essential industries that meet critical global demands and make modern life possible. The needs of these key industries, like life sciences, power, energy, and food and beverage, are transforming and growing as our customers encounter more complex challenges amidst the shifting global and economic landscape. We are helping our customers rise to this challenge every day, providing advanced technologies and expertise built over decades of leading domain knowledge. With our $2.2 billion software portfolio, we are empowering customers to use automation to optimize their operations and realize the benefits of pursuing practical, scalable digital transformation. We enable our customers to use technologies that create safer, more sustainable operations, enhancing reliability and top quartile performance while creating tech-focused, secure jobs for the workforce of the future. Emerson offers a broad range of devices and sensors to allow companies unprecedented insight into their vital equipment. Whether in a pharmaceutical company or offshore oil platform, enable precise management of complex machinery. And we are continuing to build on our strong software and data management technologies to give customers real-time data and operational analytics to identify areas for improvement and to find problems before they occur. We have seen firsthand the impacts of automation in daily life and in moments of challenge that are accelerating the need for digital transformation. We have been working closely with more than 20 pharmaceutical companies to automate operations so they can more quickly manufacture life-saving vaccines and treatments. We have quickly pivoted to meet changing manufacturing capacity needs amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are positioned to help our customers continue exploring automation as a value driver for decades to come. Everything we do at Emerson supports essential industries and drives innovation that makes the world healthier, safer, smarter, and more sustainable. Welcome everyone to this session. My name is Vicente Rios and I am the responsible for the operation side of the of the simulation business in Europe. During this presentation, we are going to present how mixed reality combined with the digital twin can help to achieve operational standards by combining these technologies. We will start with a short introduction about the concept of mixed reality digital twin and other related concepts. We will then go through the history of augmented and virtual reality and look at is expected from these technologies in the future. We will present in more detail how digital twin and mixed reality work and will highlight the benefits of this technology in the world of plant operations. Last but not least, we will present several use cases of how this technology were applied by Emerson. Let's start with the digital twin. The power of the digital twin is no longer just around the visualization and the collaboration of a specific piece of equipment to manage if life cycles. We can now use the digital twin to understand better the entire operation. They have demonstrated to provide benefits along uh, the whole project life cycle from conceptual design up to plant operations with higher return on investment during the startup and commissioning uh, for greenfield projects and revamps. With virtual reality and augmented reality, in the recent times, they have evolved from an aspirational to uh, technologies which add real value to the process industries. Also known as mirror reality, they represent a fundamental shift in the way that the digital twin is interacting with the real environment. Augmented reality, virtual reality, digital twins are becoming key enablers of the business to visualize insights from their plant operations. Let's see a little bit more what is mixed reality. Here you can see the continuum between physical environment and virtual reality. Mixed reality refers to the general case of combining images from ranges that goes from general data, such as videos, to visual images coming from model environments, such as, for example, 3Ds. If we look this from a different perspective, mirror reality can be also defined as the merge between the real world and the physical world to produce 
new environments and visualizations where physical and digital objects together and interact in real time. Depending on the particular displays, uh, mixed reality encompasses from augmented reality to augmented virtuality. Let's take more a deep look to this type of concepts more in detail. Let's start with augmented reality. This technology adds digital elements to life, uh, often using different type of mechanisms, such as cameras on the smartphone or smart glasses. Example of this, you can find it in your uh, life with the Snapchat lessons or some games like Pokemon Go. In this case, the user is still having a strong presence in the real world. If we look this from virtual reality point of view, this technology implies the full immersion experience that shut down the physical world. Using devices such as Oculus Rift, HD device, uh, PlayStation VR, the users are transported into a virtual world uh, with uh, images and environments. In this case, the virtual reality takes over all your sense, vision, to give you the full immersion and the impression that you are somewhere else. Here you can see some of the concepts that we have discussed. The mixed reality and also the importance of virtual reality and the physical environment from the perspective of the objects. Let's look a little bit to the history that this uh, technology has. Our journey goes back from 1838 uh, with uh, Charles Whiston, with it invented the stereoscope, uh, a device which allowed the users to see different images in two different which is eye, and basically creating some effect of 3D images uh, which seems uh, far distance. We will continue then with the kinetoscope invented by uh, Charles Darwin, uh, uh, Thomas Edison and William Dixon, where it was having a, a piece of film in between where you were having a light bulb, a light bulb and a lens and a piece of film in between, which it was basically uh, going through and uh, through a peephole, the user was able to see images. Almost 70 years later, we have the sensorama that it was invented by Ivan uh, Sather. It was uh, basically a device which included an stereoscopic 3D display and additional ventilators to imitate the wind, emotional chairs and even other emitters. Ten years later is when the first headset was invented by uh, Ivan Sutherland. It was heavy and primitive and it was hauled from the uh, ceiling. This is the reason that it was called the World of Damocles, inspired on the Greek myth. During the 80s, it was a big boom on this type of technologies with the first portable AR device, the ITAP. This device was superposing images into the real world. It was a portable computer that it was carrying in a backpack. Jaron Lehner later invented also the iPhone glasses and the data glove with position tracking technology. This person also, it was the person who coined the term of virtual reality. During the decade of the 90s, it was a huge investment on the virtual reality, especially due to the gaming consoles. Sega and Nintendo, they create their own headset devices for uh, virtual reality. Virtual Boy and Sega VR was the most well-known one. During the past two decades, we have seen a growth of these uh, virtual reality technologies, thanks mainly to the gaming which has made it accessible to the market and reducing the cost in the production. Let's see what, um, how this grows and the future of this technology is. Augmented reality, as I mentioned, has been around for a while and has a beautiful future uh, of the beginning of this uh, 2020 uh, and this new decade. This, the biggest application for now is gaming, but there are other sectors that they are basically reducing and increasing the acquisition of this type of technology. According to the research of uh, re, uh, ResearchGate, um, there is almost 1.2 millions of usage for augmented reality and virtual reality from healthcare uh, point of view. But it is expected to also to escalate it uh, up to 5.1 by 2025 which shows a great promotion of this type of technology on the application front. We can see more or less similar statistics for engineering, for life, real estate, where we have seen a growth in this type of technology, 
mainly thanks to the availability of, for everyone to access to this type of technologies. These expectations are also aligned with the market statistics that augmented reality according to uh, Statista. The global augmented reality uh, it's showing a market at the beginning of 2017 of around 11.5 billion and so a, a progression of, of growth of around 771 billion by 2025 with a, a growing CRGR of 63. Augmented re reality also add additional elements into the system which is generating uh, a, a future growth. With this I will pass the slides to my colleagues, Miguel. Thank you, Vicente. Um, before explaining how mixed reality can be applied on digital twins, uh, let's first define what we understand for uh, that in a process industry. Okay, uh, in process industries, we have uh, in the real plant the physical side. This means uh, physical equipment such as vessels, distillation columns, valves, piping, etc., and the control system. Uh, each of these um, um, units are, are sending signals between uh, each other. And then we have the operator control room or the main control room where uh, operators are sit in front of operator consoles and see the information from, from the plan. If we uh, represent this real world uh, uh, mathematically, what uh, we have is a digital twin. The digital twin is composed for various uh, components, starting for the first principle simulation engine that represents the physical site, the physical process, um, and contains as well vessels, distillation columns, representation of centrifugal um, uh, compressors, uh, and so on. Then we have the DCS and ESD representation, that it's a, an exact copy of the database that we have in the real plan, but that runs in a separate a standalone PC using a proprietary software. This piece of software connects to a replica of the operator consoles that we have uh, in the real plan, but in this case is interacting, the operator is interacting with a virtual representation of the process. The thing is that companies are using digital twins basically to understand better their assets, but the facility, right? By modeling different scenarios with the goal of making proactive instead of reactive decisions. One of the benefits of this is that you can use the digital twin as a test bench to improve your operations, but even you can use it as an operator training simulator to train your control room operators, not only in uh, normal situations, but especially in those situations that occur rarely in the plant. The thing is that this approach is, as you can infer from my words, are basically focused on engineering and control room operators. But what happens with field operators, which are a critical part of our operations crew? Mixed reality paired with the digital twin allows to involve field operators and mixed reality is actually a key enabler to workforce improvement uh, in productivity for industrial settings. Let's see how first virtual reality and then augmented reality can be coupled with the digital twin in order to improve the, um, uh, the benefits that we can obtain from digital twins. First, what we have is the 3D field operator station with augmented uh, virtual reality. Actually, the field operators are nowadays typically trained on classroom settings with manuals and almost never interacting with real plants. Applying this type of training is far from realistic, far from real, and can be confusing for operators and in sometimes when using outdated manuals, it can be even dangerous for process units. Combining the digital twin with virtual reality, what you can do is train your field operators using the same simulator that we were explaining before that has been successfully applied in control rooms. The digital twin with virtual reality creates an immersive simulation environment for planning, training and operation support. 
it delivers a more complete way to onboard new operators, train them on the standard operating procedures and maintenance. Also, give them a tool that helps them to understand better the process they are working on and even improve the communication between the entire operations team. Examples of this include training personnel on crisis management uh, processes in a realistic and immersive situation, or even developing best practices for communication between the operations screen during commissioning, shutdowns, turnarounds, outages. Everything can be trained without affecting the actual plan and production. Actually, using the virtual reality, um, has shown in recent Amazon projects uh, that operators retain more knowledge and perform better on skill assessments by experiencing these real life scenarios. This in the end is translated into a safer and more effective performance of your facility. In, on the other hand, augmented reality can be applied to digital twins to increase workforce collaboration and effectiveness from control room operators, engineers, experts, and field operators. Let's have a look at the different uses of this technology in the following video. Okay, so now we have the video and then I can continue, I guess, right? <laughs> Okay, so let's see how Emerson implements augmented reality and digital um, virtual reality into a digital twin. Emerson Digital Twin is based on Mimic. Mimic is our proprietary simulation and connectivity software that sets the um, the funds uh, of the uh, our digital twin. This uh, digital uh, mimic can be connected to Aspentech uh, HiSys uh, models and integrated into a digital twin. Aspen HiSys can leverage the, these multipurpose dynamic simulation models that have been used from engineering phases and integrated into a digital twin to perform um, ICS tests and, op and also to do operational support. In terms of virtual reality, we are using what we call the Mimic Field 3D, which is our proven technology to train operators, field operators on uh, realistic environments, as we said before. With regards to augmented reality, as we have seen in the, in the video, in the previous video, is uh, Plan with Optics Augmented Reality is Amazon certified platform for uh, augmented reality that uh, opens the door to increase these collaborations. All in all, what uh, we have said at the beginning, digital twins have uh, proven to provide benefits from early phases in the engineering phase up to the operations and, and maintenance, increasing project certainty and as well increasing uh, operations certainty. However, by plugging in uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, we can increase um, the benefits that we can obtain from digital twins, mainly in three areas. The first one is improving employee training. So it helps to set up training sessions, not only for panel operators, but the entire operations team and foster operational excellence and training all together as a whole team, as in the real world should happen. It also helps to minimize the what is known as, as the skill labor shortage that uh, many operating companies, especially in the oil and gas, are experiencing. When it comes to attracting the right talent by integrating these new technologies that are more familiar to younger generations, they're called gamers, uh, operating companies are experiencing a smoother onboard uh, journey. Second, these technologies allow us to increase field worker productivity. Leveraging the use of overlaid information is gaining support in the maintenance department. So using a device, an IoT devices or headsets that add text, icon, images, 3D models, or animations to real world equipment means efficient troubleshooting and more independent decisions from the uh, field worker. 
the third area is the reinforced workforce uh, collaborations with even live, uh, live remote assistance. With augmented reality, field workers and remote experts can collaborate visually to efficiently resolve issues. Experts can remotely inspect and provide immediate guidance to improve fixed rates and at the same time, reduce traveling costs. So all in all, uh, to stay competitive, uh, what we want to say is that mixed reality, virtual reality and augmented reality are key technologies to couple with digital twins. Together, these technologies are set to contribute greatly towards the so-called Industry 4.0 movement. It allows to capturing and contextualizing all this massive bunch of data that we have in the process assets and sharing it to the right people at the right time to promote operational excellence. So thank you for your attention. If you want more information about how Emerson is implementing digital twins, just follow the link uh, below, uh, emerson.com slash digital twin. And of course, if you want more information, you can contact either Vicente or myself. Thank you very much. And we are open to any questions um, that you may have.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are proud to present APROS software for analysis and dynamic simulation by Fortuna BTT from Finland. The title of our presentation is Simulate, Don't Speculate, which refers to a key benefit from dynamic simulation. My name is Matti Palekka. I come from VTT Technical Research Center of Finland, and I'm giving this presentation together with my colleague, Toni Salminen from Fortum. Next, Toni will introduce you to Fortum. Thank you, Matti. And also welcome on my behalf to hear our APRES presentation. So first we would like to introduce Fortum and VTT to you. And Fortum is a European energy company, which core operations are the production and delivery of electricity, heating and cooling to our customers. Our production fleet consists of hydropower, nuclear power and combined and heat and power plants, as well as a growing fleet of wind and solar plants. Nowadays, Fortum uh, also owns a majority share of energy company Uniper, and together we are the third largest producer of CO2 free electricity in Europe. And thanks to the expertise that we have gathered over the years of operating different kind of power plants, we are able to provide different kind of services and solutions to our customers, such as a simulation software. PTT is basically what you get in a 5 million country if you put together all applied research of technologies into one organization. So it's a multi-technology uh, organization of a bit more than 2,000 experts of different domains, ranging from ICT electronics to uh, energy and to biotechnologies, food and beverage. Uh, so VTT provides uh, research and development and innovation services and technical support for all sorts of industries and the society. We have unique experimental facilities, uh, computational uh, tools, often used in integration with uh, experiments. And we are not only technologists, we also have uh, human factors experts helping out in both uh, uh, control room as well as the organization and, and such and business development. On this slide, we have collected the main points about the use of APRUS and what it is like. What you can do with it, where you can use it, why you would use it, and then what it is like as a software product. Main uses of APRUS are related to the engineering support from both safety perspective as well as the performance. To automation testing, where you connect the automation software to, to the simulation engine before you commission it, and to the training of operating personnel, demonstrating the dynamics of the system. The origins of APRS are in power plant analysis and power plant simulation, and it has been used extensively also in simulating the transmission and distribution of energy in different forms, as well as integrating the consumer side. In sector coupling, we talk about not only production of electricity, but also district heating, district cooling, chemicals, and uh, analyzing and optimizing the whole uh, system on a holistic level. And uh, during the recent years, APRS has also been taken into use in ships. I will tell you more about that in a minute. The key motivation for the use of APRS is that you get more information earlier. You just have to use the real facility uh, to, to find out how it performs. Uh, but also already before the facility has been built, you, you get information about the safety and performance. A key benefit of APRUS compared to many other tools is that as it's built on mechanistic models, first principles, the validity range is wide, from cold startups to normal operations, transients, accidents. 
the software itself is modern and it keeps developing and the user community is active. Another key benefit is that it puts all together. It's an integrated environment where in different windows, you can have a process and piping, automation and logics, electrical systems, and domain specific models such as uh, methanation, uh, electrolysis, uh, nuclear reactor, or, or uh, furnace model. And all of these are interconnected seamlessly. APRS users include uh, power plant suppliers, uh, power plant operators, safety regulators, equipment suppliers, control system suppliers, universities, many kinds of organizations. Then to our applications. We have selected to this presentation five different application areas from thermal power to the use of molten salt to power to X uh, to LNG and marine shipbuilding applications and then to, to nuclear. So, Tony, please start with thermal power. Thank you, Matti. So here you can see some topics and questions which we and our customers have encountered over the years in on the thermal power sector and where APRES has been successfully used to find the needed answers. So APRES has been used, for example, improving boiler startup procedures, testing control systems, and also training power plant operators. Now, some recent use cases where we at Fortum have utilized APROS on thermal sector are the operator training simulators, which are related to our operation and maintenance services to T-Side in the UK and HQ Power in Rwanda. So in these sites, Fortum is responsible for training the power plant personnel for these new power plants. And in this task, we have used the APROS-based simulators to train operators and help them familiarize with the power plant dynamics before the power plant startup. But since I truly believe that a live demo tells a whole lot more than just power plant slides, let's take a look at what a pro simulation model really looks like. So here I have a pro software open and here I have a combined cycle gas turbine demo model open. And let me quickly give you an introduction to this model and then do some simulations. So here, uh, the simulation model consists of several different diagrams. And here I have opened one diagram where a gas turbine model has been created. And you can think about these diagrams in the same way as process and instrumentation diagrams. So one system uh, has been specified in one diagram and it's then uh, connected to the other systems. So here we have the air coming to this compressor and then entering into the combustion chamber where the fuel is also being fed and where burning takes place. Then we have the turbine model where thermal expansion takes place and then in the end hot flue gases uh, flow out of this system into this heat recovery steam generator. Now I'm navigating to this uh, heat recovery boiler. We have these connection flags. So we are entering into this new diagram and here on the left side uh, the hot flue gases are flowing and giving heat to the different heat exchangers, superheaters, evaporators, economizers and in this simulation model we have also one heat exchanger for district heating warming up and in the end the hot flue gases are flowing out of the system into a boundary condition simulating the flue gas stack. On the right hand side we have the water steam side so feed water is coming here from the top, going through these different heat exchangers, uh, go, going to the steam drum and also going to these evaporators 
from there. And in the end, the superheated, uh, the steam goes into these superheaters where it's being superheated. And here in this model, we have some up temperators and also overpressure valves. And then in the end, the fresh live steam goes to the turbine plant. So here in this diagram, we have a simplified model of a turbine island. So we have the fresh steam going to this high pressure turbine section, then having intermediate turbine section and low pressure turbine section. And also the bypass system of the turbine uh, is, is modeled here. And then in the end, uh, the expanded steam is being condensated uh, in the condensers. And in this demo model, we have a, a simplified model of the district heating system. So it's producing district heating. And then the condensate is being pumped and warmed up within the preheaters before it goes to this feed water tank. And from there, uh, pumped back to this, uh, via these feed water pumps through economizers to the steam drum. So this is a very quick introduction to the process side, but really, as Matti mentioned earlier, the key benefit of a process is that you can really have the combined uh, simulation model of including process, automation, and electrical. So let's let's show you some some logics that we have simulated here. So here we have the uh, connection of this gas supply valve, and when I navigate into these related logics. We go to an automation diagram, and within APROS, one can simulate both uh, analog and binary, so digital uh, automation systems. So you could uh, model both and have the included uh, calculations, P, PI, PID controllers, and such simulated here within APROS. Of course, one could also uh, interconnect the virtual automation of a real power plant as part of the process model uh, if you would like to test the virtual automation instead of simulating the logics. And then the electrical part. So here, for example, this gas turbine is connected to the electrical system model via shaft component to which I'm navigating next. So here you can see a simplified electrical model of the power plant internal network. So we have uh, one generator related to this gas turbine, another generator related to this uh, steam turbine. Then we have different uh, bus bars and interconnections, uh, transformers, different voltage levels being simulated. And then also this external power connection uh, that is taking care of the frequency control in the simulation model uh, is shown here. So really you can do this kind of integrated simulation models. So next, uh, I will do some transient simulation. And what I will do is that I will manually uh, modify the gas supply coming to this gas turbine. And we can then see the effects, what it is having uh, to this power plant process. So I will now start the simulation. And we can see that the power plant process is, is running very steadily. So around 32 megawatts of electrical power being produced with the gas turbine and around five megawatts of power with the steam turbine. Now I will manually decrease the set point value of this uh, gas supply. You can see the effects. So I'm now decreasing. And we can see that the gas valve uh, is being closed. So it's uh, supplying less gas. The mass flows are being calculated, and as a result, we can see that the combustion chamber temperature is decreasing, and also uh, the flue gas temperature as a result uh, is decreasing. So we are providing less heat now to this heat recovery steam generator. Let me speed up this a little bit. So give some more, more set point changes. And then we can analyze the transient behavior. So after having these set point changes, the gas turbine power is decreasing around 28 megawatts. 
and steam power around 4.4, but transient situation goes very smoothly. Uh, no big oscillations or alterations there. Uh, the control systems are uh, doing a quite good job uh, with, when handling this process here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have an announcement to make. We are about to release a whole new product, APROS District, for the modeling and simulation of urban energy systems. It will really take it to a new level. You have seen district heating simulators, but this is something wider. APROS District has models for the generation of energy, distribution, storage, and also consumer models can be built using it, and also including the weather effects. It extends uh, the regular APROS by a component library for district uh, energy systems, a map-based user interface, as well as data imports. So please contact us for further information. Molte Salt is very interesting in, in many modern energy applications. In concentrated solar power plants uh, with the use of molten salt, you can continue generation even when the sun no longer shines at night. And in nuclear applications, for instance, molten salt can help in different flexibility needs so that the reactor can operate in a stable manner. However, the overall plant can supply electricity in a flexible manner. Or in fusion, where the generation will be pulse-wise, and, uh, and then the molten salt can, can store heat for stable electricity production. Molten salt is an example of the flexibility of APRS. Uh, APRS can have different types of fluid models, and all the same process components can be used with basically any fluid that is modeled into the system. The molten salt model uh, can facilitate the the solution of different salts, salt variations, and also together with the salt, there can be different gases, there can be air, argon, nitrogen, what you wish to use with, the, with the, the molten salt. And also all automation and electrical systems are naturally, can naturally be used together with molten salt systems. Next, I will give uh, demonstration of a molten salt model, which also demonstrates another uh, fluid, uh, which is uh, not very typical, uh, but very interesting in modern applications. It's a supercritical carbon dioxide. So the scope of this model includes the solar collectors that bring in the heat of the sun to the system. By double clicking a flag like this, uh, you get to, uh, to the next uh, diagram page where we have uh, storage tanks for, for the molten salt. And then from there, we get to the, to the next um, diagram page where uh, the, there's a, the heat exchanger to produce this supercritical CO2, which then spins the turbine, which generates electricity. And you can see the, the electricity is the green line. It uh, remains on a stable level, even though the sun goes down. One of the topics of modern energy systems is power to gas, which means conversion of power to gas. One often refers to power to X, a conversion of power to 
anything valuable, anything that may be better business than, than just selling electricity, because the electricity price can be rather low due to the uh, weather dependent uh, generation of electricity by wind and solar. So APRES has already been used for a number of um, uh, processes related to power to X or power to gas. At VTT, we have a research team of uh, fuel cells and hydrogen, and another research team related to the uh, energy efficiency and decarbonization of, of industries. And uh, examples of what has been modeled uh, with APRUS are electrolysis, CO2 capture from air, methanation, and, and fuel cells. This is a demonstration of an APRUS model, which includes electrolyzers, gas storages, I mean, oxygen and hydrogen storages, uh, carbon dioxide capture from the air, methanation, and feed to, to the gas grid. As a result of overproduction of hydrogen, we get increased pressure and the high pressure section starts to operate and the electrolysis goes to lower operation level. Intermediate storage pressure level decreases and high pressure storage valve opens, like shown here, and the hydrogen feed to methanation remains rather stable. Since a few years now, uh, we are cooperating with uh, the shipbuilding company Mayer and the Turku Finland organization uh, in uh, modeling and simulation of ship energy systems and the use of LNG especially. Using APRUS, Mayer has been able to create integrated models of their ship energy systems that can be used for the engineering support as well as the uh, operational support to their customers. And that way, the emissions from marine transport has been reduced and novel technologies have been taken into use. Yes, so next. Uh, let's move on to this nuclear sector and how we at Fortum has been utilizing APRUS. So we use it very much to support Lovisa NPP operation as we are the owner and operator of Lovisa NPP. And what we use it for? Uh, we use it, for example, to calculate the official safety analysis of Lovisa NPP, which are then reviewed by the Finnish nuclear regulatory body STUK. We use it also in very many different projects where process and automation changes are done. So we use APRUS to verify, for example, the design beforehand and also tune the new automation system controllers before implementing uh, these changes on this power plant. And this uh, testing and verification uh, before implementation helps us to minimize uh, any potential problems and delays uh, that might uh, come in the, in, in the commission phase. And also the new operator training simulator, LOX2 of Lobby's NPP is fully based on APRUS. So we use APRUS for very many different purposes in Lovisa. And next, I would like to show you a short video uh, how APRUS can be used, for example, to simulate malfunction situations in nuclear power plant. So next, I will show you a video of pulp malfunction simulation in APRUS. So here uh, in this video, I'm showing you a generic pressure water reactor of VVR type. And what will happen in this video is that one of the main reactor coolant pumps uh, is being tripped. Uh, manually by creating this kind of an artificial uh, signal that is affecting the automation systems. And at the moment, uh, the nuclear power plant is running uh, on 85% uh, 
uh, total power. And what you can see here is that on the left side there are pump protection logics to which a new artificial uh, signal will be created. And during the simulation we can then see what happens. So first a signal is being created and then since this is going to this projection shut terminal, you can see that when it's being stopped, then the reactor protection systems are being activated since they notice that one of the main coolant pumps is, is, is being lost. And now you can see on the right hand side that the pump is coasting down and therefore also the mass flows are being decreased. And then we can see that actually when the pump goes down, goes down that the flow also turns uh, turns around, so it's going to a different direction since the pump is not providing head anymore. And then we can analyze the main variables. So we can see that before the trip, the relative power of the reactor was around 85%, but due to this reactor protection uh, limitation, since we lost one of the main coolant pumps, uh, the reactor uh, power is being limited and then it is around 78%. But uh, the power plant uh, process remained up and running. No reactor trip or turbine trip occurred. And the power plant uh, is still producing electricity. Another big topic in nuclear these days is the small modular reactors. And surely we are a part of that. Uh, we have multiple capabilities related to the, to the modeling of different SMR types. Okay, but then what can we do for you? Our cooperation models are very flexible. If you want to uh, start modeling and simulation by APROS, we can sell or rent licenses and provide software maintenance, updates, uh, training, mentoring. Uh, on the other hand, if you are not interested in developing modeling competencies in house, we can also do modeling and analysis services for you or any combination of these. Also, uh, we are interested in, in turnkey simulation system uh, deliveries, operator training simulators, automation testing simulators, and then software integration projects as well, in which uh, engineering systems or uh, could be could be connected to the to the simulation system so that so that uh, the data configuration data is co is synchronized and compared with between different systems or reused or uh, maybe some simulation models that you already have in use could be used together with APROS in a co-simulation mode. We have uh, done co-simulation with uh, uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics uh, tools, uh, as well as uh, with finite element method uh, tools for structural uh, integrity, like pressure transient. Uh, analysis and that kind of things. Good. So we are coming to the end of our presentation, so we would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, if you would like to know more about APROS, uh, then you can visit our product web page www.apros.fi. So you can find out more about our references, success stories, white papers, and also videos and news regarding APRUS. So, thank you.
Hello everyone, I'm Stian Tangen. I'm product manager for Model Insight in Kongsberg. And today we're going to talk about quite a few interesting topics. We are going to look into the future of dynamic simulation. Uh, we're going to see how case spice can be leveraged in the cloud, uh, both for increased use of the simulator, but also for increased remote collaboration, both for engineering and for training purposes. Uh, then we're also going to touch upon how we can uh, uh, leverage dynamic simulators in digital twins, uh, which my colleague is going to have a presentation on uh, later, later today. Uh, but before we, we go into all the details and all the new uh, hip, new cool stuff that we're doing for, for K-SPICE and dynamic simulation, I want to tell you a little bit about where we're coming from with the tool and how it's traditionally been before we dive into how we bring that into the future. Uh, so dynamic simulation is the closest you can get to the operational behavior of the actual process plant before deploying it. Uh, it's a very powerful statement that we use and it, it actually is the closest you can get to the actual plant before it's built. Uh, to a process engineer, this is the true digital twin. But of course, um, there's many other disciplines, uh, automation, mechanical, structural engineers, and they have a different view on what the digital twin is. Uh, so we're also going to show that in the next presentation, how all of the disciplines have gotten uh, integrated into the same environment and can collaborate across their disciplines more efficiently. But for dynamic simulation for the process engineer, we help um, uh, the process operators by increasing the net uh, present value of optimizing the field. So we start off early and we help them uh, enable and look at their process control design, making sure that it's the best that it can be so that we can reduce the capex as far as possible. Uh, this also is true uh, modification projects. We ensure that uh, all oil fields can have properly trained and safe operators, uh, thus helping to reduce the opex. Um, and through both an optimized design and well-trained operators, uh, the plant in essence becomes safer, more optimized and more robust and more uh, increased profits just due to everything being uh, working more stably. Um, so by reducing uh, oscillatory behavior for a plant and actually stabilizing it, you can bring the production up towards uh, the production limits of your field and produce more oil given the same uh, uh, operations that you have on the oil field. The only thing we haven't cracked yet is, is how to increase the oil price, but it's, it's doing really well these days, so we can't complain. It's a lot better than it uh, was a couple of years ago. Uh, but then for the background of, of K-SPICE itself and where it's coming from, uh, K-SPICE is a traditional desktop application with uh, a legacy of uh, well, up to 30 years. Uh, it came from, from other legacy tools that have been merged into one. But it is, in a sense, a legacy desktop application where you install it on your computer and you keep all your project files on that same computer. And collaboration has typically been through file sharing or uh, screen sharing. But it is, in a sense, a very good tool. And it's built upon user friendliness and accuracy, dependent on how much data you actually input into the model. So all the modules that we see in KSPICE are high fidelity and they're built on first principle uh, with rigorous thermodynamics at the bottom. I would typically make it easy for everyone to model this, as all the modules can have a detailed input or a limited data input along with uh, uh, file references to, to all the data that you input into it. So it also becomes a library of all the data that you've built the model on, making it very intuitive to work with and also to explore. 
uh, in, addition, in addition to this, there is also then a lot of control modules, system and cause and effect diagrams, sequencing, and everything that's possible to both do engineering and generic training up, upon. But taking this application one step then into the future. Uh, so what we're working on now is that we've actually taken the back end of the software and moved that up into the cloud, which means also then all of your project files resides in the cloud. And we can actually deploy the front end to the users, licenseless, and it will stream all the resources that you would need and then syncing all the changes. So that means also that we can handle licensing on the back end, making it simpler for the user to actually get hold of the software, uh, having it up and running anywhere, and yet just paying for a license in the cloud. The other benefit of this is, of course, that it enables uh, collaboration as multiple users from different locations can connect in towards the same model running in the cloud. Uh, this also enables uh, multi-screen support and easy training uh, with the generic control system that comes uh, included with, with the case by software. Um, for, for engineering, typically you don't need that many screens. So this becomes then the perfect tool where actually multiple users can actually also work with the same model at the same time as all changes are being synced continuously. Uh, I've just shown a, a screenshot of the new option that is coming into the, the later releases of Casebys. You can see now you have an option to connect to a remote link, uh, specifying where it should contact and stream all the project resources from. Uh, so, so really moving our dynamic simulation software up into the cloud it opens up a vast new possibility set that we have within uh, the Cognitwin framework. So this is kind of a crowded slide, yet very informative at the same time. Um, so I'll just take you somewhat through what we what we have here. Uh, the Cognitwin platform is now not only hosting uh, simulator software, but it's also hosting a vast contextualization engine that will contextualize all the data that's available for your old platform into a seamless environment where everything can talk to each other and you can utilize all the data together. So I'll, I'll stick to, to the simulation part of this as my colleague will take you through this journey later on. Um, but as we can see, case bytes will also be a part of this environment. So I'll, I'll get a little bit back to, to how we're going to use uh, simulation towards the Cognitwin, but let's first now focus on, on what this enables in terms of remote collaboration. Um, this is somewhat close to what the home office setup looks like. Uh, for engineers, they typically might have uh, one additional screen. Worst case, they're just working on their laptops directly. And more often than not, I, I see that the operators uh, that's sitting on home office and want to train on their specific plant, they are unfortunately in a lot of cases just sitting on their laptop. So they just have one small screen available to their disposal to actually do any, uh, any kind of training uh, now during the pandemic, unless they can get to their actual training room. And uh, if we start off with the aspect of training, what does that actually mean uh, when you talk in terms of dynamic simulation? So any sort of proper operator training, it also needs a control system uh, built into the dynamic simulator. Uh, case bytes can of course connect to all of the major uh, control system uh, vendors. Delta V, Yokogawa, ABB, etc. all of them. And these control system vendors also really need to provide a remote way of, of training if this is to be done uh, efficiently. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example 
of of a generic or a specific uh, operator training facility. It typically looks something like this, where you have about uh, eight big screen uh, screens tracking the overall performance of your of your plant, and then each operator have three to four monitors to actually monitor the plant as they work through work through it. And and for the operators, um, it is very important to actually be able to train in a realist, realistic environment, and typically also to train on what is important to them, and that might be uh, control room collaboration that they actually have with their colleagues, or collaboration with the, the outside operator, the field operator, to make sure the, the plant works as efficiently as it should. Uh, through this, though, uh, a lot a lot of training can still do be done with with one screen. However, uh, this this is a, a challenge that is important to to solve moving into a more uh, digital age, where where it's impossible to bring these kind of uh, operated training rooms available into your home office. Uh, but it could be a possibility with the use of uh, virtual reality technology. But then, when is all of these features needed in the in the face of a training simulator, or or the way to an operator training simulator? So, so typically through the the, the life cycle of a, of a oil platform, you start off uh, somewhere around front end engineering doing uh, proper dynamics. In, in this period, you are typically just dependent on the Dynamics simulation software in itself. And for that, one or two screens is plenty. And then any kind of virtual desktop solution, or the way we've brought it now, KSpice into the cloud, uh, gives you the same experience as you would have had if you're in the office, uh, compared to being at a home office or any other location. It's always available on demand. And this, this is also more or less true as you go through detailed engineering and you actually get a, a first version of your control system that you can test out and verify and validate. Uh, typically then it's a set of engineers collaborating around this, uh, this tool. And then it's also more down to testing the sequences and the details of it. And you're typically more than happy with uh, one uh, screen for a simulator and one screen for for uh, for the control system, which is quite typical for for an engineer at the, at the home office. But then, as we move closer to the actual uh, delivery of uh, of an operator training uh, system, you are going to be dependent on more operator screens, uh, which is going to be uh, a challenge in a home office environment. So this is this is a discussion that I would would like to have with the uh, with you as an attendees to this this event. Uh, so please come and find my avatar um, after a presentation. But then stepping into into the more futuristic side of things, uh, let's look at how we could utilize dynamic simulation within a cognitive twin or a digital twin environment where actually all data all imaginable data is available in a contextualized way uh, what benefits can a high fidelity dynamic simulator do then for the data that you have available for your field so i'll take you through some of the products that we already have today and how these can be leveraged to actually increase the value of everything that you already have. Um, so, so we have our, our uh, case by match and always on solutions already. And this is a product where uh, the dynamic simulator is matched to a high fidelity towards the real plant. Uh, this can, of course, be used for, for multiple uh, things. You could use this for, for starting off operator training or starting off uh, uh, what-if simulations for your plant. 
but more importantly, in a Cognitwin Twin environment, you could also utilize this model to pre-validate any optimization loops that you're planning to implement that will run automatically continuously on your asset. And you can also utilize this to verify machine learning algorithms or advanced control philosophies. Uh, typically, uh, a plant that is in operation, you want to keep it as stable as possible without any process upsets. So to be, to be able to produce any kind of relevant data or uh, optimize something, you need a very, very good dynamic simulation to give you uh, the operational windows that you haven't seen before. Uh, so this is one of the key elements into to validating all the additional features that you need into a system uh, that can do that you want to do, use to utilize to to optimize your plant both in terms of uh, looking into the future or continuously updating your control system uh, i know a lot of a lot of you have a dream of having a one button startup uh, for a plant and having it fully automated i don't think there is a way to get there without uh, proper dynamic simulation to test, optimize, and validate all of this. Uh, move, moving onwards, we also have a case based meter. Uh, this is this is an application that uh, that somewhat uh, builds upon what I just uh, just said, as it is a, a hybrid virtual flow meter solution that is based on on uh, on, on Ledaflow, a high fidelity multi phase tool combined with machine learning to make the highest accuracy possible when it comes to virtual flow metering. Um, and, and this is this is a reliable alternative to, to well-based virtual flow metering. Um, and its installation is of course much simpler. Um, it's, a, it's a tough statement to say that you can, can drop uh, multi-phase metering altogether as you need some data to, to validate your dynamic model on to begin with. But a lot can also be done in advance to everything that you deploy uh, for these, these models in the sense of having uh, uh, more tests done on choke valves, for instance, that you're going to um, deploy subsea so that you know the performance of the model before it's, uh, before it's installed. Uh, other things that's that's important uh, for for a, a dynamic digital twin, or for dynamic simulation for that matter, is um, is being able to to validate and verify and track the performance on all your equipment on the plant. Uh, so we have a package for that case by analyze, and by having a complete model running in parallel with your actual state you also get the access to thousands of virtual measurements throughout the entire plant, as you have a virtual representation of the plant in real time running alongside your plant. Uh, but not only that, we also utilize the simulator to, to back calculate the performance of all major equipment. Uh, so like for control valves, we will continuously be drawing the expected behavior of the CV curve, so you can use that to compare towards your design data. In a lot of cases, we have actually found out that uh, the plant has been delivered different uh, types of valves, or it's been uh, installed valves that was, wasn't expected valve. Uh, and this might be of many reasons. It also might be just as simple as a data sheet weren't updated. Uh, but finding all of these small uh, mistakes is, is very important if you are to use this data for something uh, bigger or for uh, optimization problems. Uh, for the bigger equipments, compressors and centrifugal pumps, uh, we back calculate their performance in, in the compressor map and you can actually see how the performance uh, throughout the life, uh, life, uh, lifetime of the compressor and how it will evolve. Uh, so this, this you could utilize then to, to see if, if the equipment is, is going to fail based on the path that it's going, 
or if it's actually performing just as it was new and you can actually trust this equipment for, for a longer period of time than what you expected. So all of these are going to be important assets when it comes into the future of dynamic simulation and how you leverage it going forwards. Uh, of course, you don't have to integrate your simul uh, simulator into a digital twin environment, but it's easy to see how much value you can extract from having a proper dynamic simulation model uh, running based on, on real-time data and actually looking into operational problems and not just design problems. Uh, a dynamic simulator can, of course, look into the simulator simulated facility behavior and help you optimize that, but it can also help you validate real-time performance or utilize it to train machine learning algorithms that can solve issues that is um, intuitive to algorithms to solve, but very tough and slow for humans' mind, minds to, to solve. And synthetic data is, is really a key to be able to to harness and, and create efficient and good machine learning algorithms. So, so I'll, I'll leave this as a, as a stepping stone for my colleague that, uh, that, that comes on later. And he will share how the Cognitive Energy uh, enables uh, the unification of data and knowledge and, peop uh, and people to, to enable the best decision uh, every time. Hi. Do you know simulation? I am the simulation. Do you know who I am? I am smart, but together we are smarter. I am digital. I am hardware. I am visible, and I'm not visible. I can be one, and I can be many. I can be the task or the solution. I can fly, drive, swim, and dive. I have a great network. I am virtual, constructive, live, or a process. Together we can learn the basics and try out your tactics. We can achieve a goal together and start over again. Together we see the future live the present, and analyze the past. I can be any person you want me to be, but I am always your partner. I am flexible. I am mobile. I can assist your coach or be your guide. I can be your team player or your opponent. I can work for you or we work in groups, but you find me wherever you are. I am the simulation. I am a part of Rhein Metall. With more than 20 years experience of research and development within eye tracking, we know that the eye holds many answers. We track, measure, and analyze human eye movements, turning sights into data and data into insights creating a deeper understanding of human behavior, intentions, and interactions all over the world. We develop the world's most advanced eye tracking systems. You certainly know this situation. Once your plant is being operated, new data is permanently generated and existing data is modified. To be more precise, your entire plant as well as equipment is documented in the form of data. Everything you have to know about your plant, everything that really matters, is spread all over numerous software applications, databases, and paper-based files. This means this data and information can neither be accessed easily or quickly, nor does it have any useful correlation. We call this data dark data. Let's be frank. 
Can you actually rely on this data? What really matters is how the data can be managed efficiently across different disciplines and along the entire life cycle in order to provide relevant information for substantial decision-making processes. Und hier kommt Planzeit ins Spiel. Planzeit wurde speziell für die Prozesse. Here, Plantsite comes in. Plantsite has been developed in particular for the process industry and consolidates all information and data, be it static or dynamic. You can consolidate, contextualize, validate, and even visualize your data and information with Plantsite. The raw data is then transferred to a complete digital twin. It is a genuine copy of your plant, which is being updated on a regular basis and grants valuable insights. Suddenly, you realize new correlations and understand how everything is interconnected with each other, where to go further, and how you can actually work with the data right now. It doesn't matter whether you are an operations manager, site manager, engineer, or operator. PlantSight helps you reveal yet hidden data, make decisions faster, and thus increase the profitability of your plant immediately as well as on a long-term basis. All this is possible with only one simple web portal, which can be easily accessed. A completely new portal allowing for realizing and enhancing the added value of the digital twin along the entire asset life cycle in process industries. Anytime, anywhere. Siemens. Ingenuity for life.